Yeah, we better do this mm. otherwise. And it has started recording, so Jenny. Hey. For real? Yes. Look. But come on, yeah. Well, no. we are just, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Mama, I'm serious, <laughs> I, have to, I have to act first bonish. What? What is that? What is acting first bonish? Like a first bonish act. You can turn the camera look deep into people's eyes. We have to focus on okay. the people. Okay. I'm focusing yes. on the okay. people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ready for the hand? Ha ha! Okay, sir. Hi! If you're new to this channel, welcome. My name is Jackie Asimwe. This is my sister, my amazing, smashing, brilliant, very brilliant, by the way, sister Wandwinji. I know, stop, okay, yeah, yeah. She's, she's just my little sister, don't mind her. I'm so glad that you're here, that you've joined us. And if you don't remember, about a year ago, I had my sister here with me and we had a conversation. And we're having another conversation that I hope will be edifying and exciting. exciting important thought provoking yes yeah. all of those things yeah. and fun so welcome we're going to talk grab something to drink we are drinking the water sensor <sighs> fish and <laughs> that's what we're doing moving quickly so along <laughs> grab something to drink come sit down with us if you need to pause go ahead and pause this yeah. is just a conversation. Yeah. So I have some questions for you, Jackie. Mm -hmm. Welcome back Thank to you. Butterflies from Biz. Yes. We're going to talk mostly about some of the things that we have been talking about mm -hmm. while you're here. Mm -hmm. You were here last May. Mm -hmm. It has been a year. Yep. What has happened? I've hopefully grown Safe Source, the company that I started in October 2017. We got new staff. We've done a few products that we're going to talk about later on in this in this segment. My boys have grown I um, I know we talked a bit last time about parenting and every year that they grow I, I go deeper into that that space of parenting teen boys and it's it's a new and interesting space for me this year we did a very exciting at least for me it was exciting we did two retreats for leaders the first one we did in January was for women EDs alone and then we did another one in February three-day training for men alone and they actually said we were the first women-led organization that had done a men-only retreat so that was exciting really we were bringing them together in a space to talk about themselves as leaders it was a stop and pause and reflect on mute we had an amazing sister feminist friend of mine Hope Chikudu to facilitate both we were talking about the energy we bring into spaces as leaders and how we can be aware of the energies that we bring she used the chakra system and uh, we talked about grounding which is the foot level we talked about the power that we hold in our bellies and what happens um, around issues of sex and sexuality which is very key for leaders to talk about and I think we often ignore. We talked about the heart and what heart we bring to the work that we do and how important it is. We talked about voice, the voice chakra, the throat. What do we speak? What truths do we speak? What do we say of ourselves, of our organizations, of the people we lead and how voice is important and how to recognize if voice is muffled and muzzled in, in your organizations and even for your life. We spoke about the third eye, intuition and how very important it is for for leaders to be connected and how to learn to listen to our intuition and use that for leadership and the last um, energy point is is the top of our head which connects us to the higher power to god to spirituality to humanity and how that connectedness you know brings all of us together but it was it was so amazing the conversations were powerful and they continue to this day and it's just amazing the kinds of stories of change that are emerging from that that is exciting and i grew a year older i'm like 49 <laughs> one year to 50 so i I'm in that space of, I know, right? I look like I'm 23. Um, <laughs> no, but yeah, for me, it is, it's this last year on the fourth floor. What are all the things that I wished I had done in my 40s that I can cram into the space of one year? And it started off very beautifully with three sisters, friends, deep, deep friends, taking me to Dubai. I've been in that space of gratitude and thankfulness about the sisters, friends that have been set up. We unfortunately often hear more about the fighting PhD syndrome, pull her down, and I'm yeah. like, no, I've been lifted by so many women in my life, including you. 
I know, right? <laughs> oh, my sister. I have actually there like five thousand follow up questions from just that one yeah, thing. But yeah. let me just ask this. Yes. So the men's retreat. Mm -hmm. What was the feedback that you got from the people who attended? One of them was thank you. Thank you for doing this. We needed this. Nobody thinks about or remembers men. And they were sharing how they don't really talk about that level of leadership, the, the, the introspection about who they are. The other thing in terms of feedback was talking about sexuality, sex and sexuality and sexual rights, sexual expression. I think in the feminist movement, because women and our bodies are all caught up in political <laughs> discussion. Yes. yes. So I think we've moved the conversation much more than men have, at least in, in the Ugandan space and mm -hmm. so that conversation alone took a whole afternoon and the next morning half wow. of the next morning so and they still felt they didn't really dig into what it really is about and I think on either side it's a lot of unlearning but I think for men much more because again the conversation at least for the men that we gathered is much newer and so I'm even looking for ways in which to enable them to have that conversation right. a bit more because yes it affects them as fathers brothers in any way that they relate as leaders mm. you know it affects so many parts of our lives and, and to see their light bulbs go off in that way was really was really amazing. So often we have conversations about hyper masculinity mm -hmm. and how it may seem like it's something that is oppressing only women but it men actually uh, their self-expression mm -hmm. their decision making their ability to just be who they are and exist as they are in whatever expression it is that they have and this mm -hmm. is not to say that there's sort of a feminine way of behaving and a masculine mm -hmm. way of behaving but how hyper masculinity has kept men back from mm -hmm. being the fullness of who they are. Yes, and I think that was one of the conversations that they had. And how liberating it is when you get to the understanding of who you are, mm -hmm. fully mm -hmm. human mm -hmm. as you are. The idea in these leaders' retreats was also that following the retreat, they should self-organize. Okay. So I've been mostly connected to the women and, and that's happening. We met once, we're going to meet again very soon. We're going to go to Lyra. One of, one of the ladies came from Lyra. So we said, you know, organize some female is there and we'll come and, and talk and share our journey. We'll have another space and moment to meet in Mitoma in August. So I know that for the women it's happening. I'm not so sure for the men. One of the things that I, I can make happen for them and I, I promise this to them was at least an additional conversation just around sex and sexuality. I know they did open up a WhatsApp group and I, I'm hoping it's active. I've also been encouraging them that we will have a moment in December this year where both groups come together and you know cross share about what this was all about and how how has their journey this year in leadership changed how have they changed in the ways they've been more aware of themselves as leaders and um, I, I am hoping that connection is happening isn't it interesting mm -hmm. how it has taken female leadership to create a space where men can come and have these sorts of discussion it's interesting to me that that is the dynamic that happens when you allow women to have mm -hmm. a certain autonomy within a group mm -hmm. which interestingly enough having gone back home this past summer and mm -hmm. had conversations with people mm -hmm. is that Ugandan women have better access to the top mm -hmm. to CEO positions mm -hmm. to political leadership than women over here you think so yeah when you go to websites mm -hmm. and you see who they have mm -hmm. they'll have like a bunch of guys and like maybe one woman and one person of color mm -hmm. and that's how they do sort of their tokenism and these people mm -hmm. end up not having any sort of real power to yeah, create yeah, change yeah, yeah. yes or no I think we do draw energy from the fact that there are many more women in place, but it didn't just happen. It really took a fight from, from women's rights activists, a fight in terms of getting our foot in the door through law. So for example, in our parliament in Uganda, part of the reason why we even have the number that we do is because in our constitution, it says a third of parliament must be women. I think there's no space in Uganda where a conversation won't happen about where are other women. Now, I think our next battle front is now that we are at the table, are we actually making the decisions? You know, so that we're not just counting. Right, you're not token women. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's challenging ourselves to that next level. Are we making the decisions? What difference are we making for other women? Who else are we bringing onto the table so that it's not elite, educated? Right, women? right. How, how, how can we make the space 
even more expansive and inclusive, um, increase um, the depth of bench. So the, the, the conversation continues. I have sons. A lot of the, what I see in our space happening are many programs for and about the girl child, you know, her voice, her value, and, and, and the space she occupies in society, which is very, very important. Now that I have sons, I've also then realized who is talking to the boys or how are boys convening in order to have those very same conversations, both about themselves and about women. When we had the women's ED retreat, which was where we were going to stop, I left thinking, this is too good to keep to ourselves. We must, if we can, avail it to the men as well. Mm -hmm. And so I was glad that we did it. It was mm -hmm. also from the point of, I can't keep this to myself, I need to share. I'm hoping, in fact, that we can continue this tradition. I hope that other organizations, or even the men themselves that go through these retreats, can also start retreats for men. Because we are, either side needs to be conversing about the issues that they face, but also hopefully bringing the conversations together. The other day, yes. on the way back from a wonderful retreat at the Rideau Mall. <laughs> that was a retreat, I want those kind. <laughs> Um, Except this time I want to spend other people's money. <laughs> <laughs> We were having a conversation yes, yes, and yes. it was a very interesting conversation mm -hmm. and it was a story. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this story. The organization that I, I work with and for is called Civ Source Africa. Part of the aim and purpose why we exist is to influence the practice and footprint of philanthropy in Africa. So we support philanthropy to help them meet their aims as, as they do charitable giving. We support building strength of civic organizers and organizations. The other key piece for us is around narrative shaping, narrative building, narrative shaping. This conversation actually started last year when I was here and I was talking to Paul I think this story, in fact, starts with our own story because I think in our family, if I look at all of us, we grew up in a space of stories. We were told so many stories, mostly Bible stories because that's our dad was a, a reverend in Anglican church. Our faith was built and founded on story. The theme of stories, I think, runs through our lives. And now, fast forward to Sin Source, the story that I want to hear about, mm -hmm. that I don't quite often hear, especially now that I'm in the philanthropy space, is the story of African philanthropists, African giving. What is that story? Who tells that story? Who are the people behind that story? How do we look into that pot and discover who is in this pot? Especially if we think about philanthropy or giving as a spectrum. There are those, if we go back to our Bible story, of the, the widow who literally gave a cent, and Jesus in fact says that is more giving than the person who has a bunch, a bunch. and gave like 1% of yes, what he had. Yeah. But, but it is true to today mm -hmm. that we celebrate and honor and recognize the guys with the bunch. Yes. And very little in fact, it's amazing that that story was even told of the, that lady who gave her all and that so many Africans, that's where we are. That's the giving that happens all the time. But what gets celebrated in Forbes magazines, in Times, in is this person over here. And of course, there are very few and mostly male. If we look at philanthropy or giving as a spectrum, I want to be telling the story of the widow who gives her all, the grandmother who gives her all to take care of an AIDS orphan, the community that gives their all. In telling those stories, I want to say it's as important, if not more, than the person who gives from their excess. Because for these guys, at this end of the spectrum, they are giving their all. Philanthropy, as defined by Google, is the desire to promote the welfare of others, expressed especially by the generous donation of money to good causes. The generous donation of money yes. to, good to good causes, causes. which excludes some of the stories yeah. that you're mentioning. So do you think that we require a different word? I think it is opening up giving to beyond money because people give up their time, of their talent, of their skill, of their knowledge, of their homes, of their food, of their gardens, of their... We give so much more than money, right? Mm -hmm. So giving shouldn't only be localized because then in economies where there's not a lot of money, giving still happens, right? It so, does. So to celebrate that as part of giving. But also in the feminist movement, we have endeavored long and hard to name women's work, unpaid labor in the home, as actually work. Because when you name it as work, you're actually able to put a value to it, a money value. So in the same way, I think that that conversation should be happening in philanthropy to say, yes, we recognize money 
and we get it in the market. However, there's also giving that happens that is non-monetary if when translated into monetary terms would actually also be as important or should be in fact factored in in the ways of giving that happen yeah also there's this notion of giving to a particular cause like mm -hmm. save the whales or save the frogs or you know <laughs> yeah. like mm -hmm. like uh, let's get connie the out frogs. of uganda yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. save the frogs okay. important rainforest creatures uh -huh. <laughs> that is how people understand what a cause is mm -hmm. as opposed to the kind of giving that happens in smaller communities. And for us, bereavement is a cause because in giving when someone is bereaved, the cause is comfort. I stand with you. The cause is solidarity. When we're giving to a ceremony like marriage, the cause is family, is continuation, is legacy, is community again. So who defines cause? Who gets to call things what they are? and is the definition closed or can you still dig deeper and find more meaning and or in fact make the meaning more inclusive which is what we would like to do in saying that there is a spectrum of giving and let's be all inclusive and celebrate the fact that humanity exists and has existed because people have given and continue to give right now we're going out looking for stories and we're asking and if, if you're watching and you can help name and and point us to stories of people who are like yeah i know a guy in my village and he used to pay school fees for all these children or he gave his land and the church was able to build a structure there those are the kinds we want to celebrate as well so please if you can um look for the sales source website and, and drop us a line drop us a word we really really want to tell those stories and celebrate african giving in all its shades and colors we're collecting proverbs on giving because again i think a proverb comes out of cultural expressions yes. africans and proverbs are like you know and for Muzara uh -huh. <laughs> and, and and so tell us the proverbs yes. around and about giving from your ethnicity we want to collect these and and share them both for ourselves but also for posterity again and to show our children that these things are part of who we are part of the fabric of our being africa is we even have proverbs that extol that encourage that celebrate giving the link to sip source will be in the description yes. box below where you can go and tell these stories and please whatever stories it is yeah. that you have what kind of things are happening at sib source that you want people to know about and what kind of things are coming up in the future wow lots happening right now we are in the process of building what we're going to call sib fund i always describe what we do as as a triangle on the top is supporting philanthropy and the corner is building strength building the strength of civic organizers and organizations mm -hmm. that's why we have the leaders retreats that's why we do you know context conversations what's happening in the context and how can organizations be proactive and also keep defending um, human rights and then shaping narrative and what narratives do we need to shape either about philanthropy civil society or, or other stories that are important to advancing the cause of human rights so those are the our three main anchors what we would like to do is build a fund that supports the base of civic organizing. A lot of money that comes to support organizations is usually targeted at or only accessible by a certain level of organizations, usually those based in the capitals, able to write stellar proposals that have systems in place to do the work that needs to be done. And we're saying that if we think of funding as supporting movement building, we also have to build the base. Mm -hmm. And so we're hoping to develop a fund with, with, with partners that helps to support young, nascent, but very innovative um, organizations that, that work with communities, but also from the base that supports the human rights movement in Uganda. So that's one. The other that is upcoming is an art fund. And this is a collaboration between ourselves, the Robert Bosch Foundation, which is based in Germany, and the Dune Foundation, based in the Netherlands. And the art fund is to support the arts in all its spectrum, but specifically those arts that also work with and support social change social transformation right now there's a mapping going on we will then have a meeting to say okay this is what the field is like how do we enable this fund you know plug plug the holes it won't be the end or be all but we want to support that space it's exciting for me because a lot of the work that that we have done is mostly with ngos and ngos are not the full definition 
know, civil society. They're just part of it. But a lot of, of donor funding goes mostly to NGO. Through the Art Fund, I think it gives us a space to experience working with another segment of civil society. <coughs> I'm really looking forward to learning. It is a learning journey. It's a one-year fund for now, but we're supposed to through this year be learning, hopefully building up the fund, learning especially how to work with non-traditional, well they call it non-traditional civil society, which really means non-NGOs, but how do you access money to people that don't have a PO box and mm -hmm. don't have an NGO, mm -hmm. but are still doing great work. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting for me. We have, like I said, the conversations that we're currently running on philanthropy in Uganda, and we've called these conversations Omutima Omugabi, which means a heart that gives, and that's where we're collecting the proverbs and the stories. We're going to have it May a few conversations with young people about what they think about philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Are we philanthropists? Who do you know that is a philanthropist? How can young people be engaged in philanthropy? And just, you know, listen in, throw the questions and, and, and continue the conversations mm -hmm. online. I think those are the three things that I want to highlight. Of course, like I said, we're continuing with, um, especially the women leaders that, that we had the retreat, retreat with both these moments to come together to talk about what is changing. But the other thing we're encouraging them is also write that story don't mm -hmm. just talk about it i'd like us to be encouraging leaders also to be in the practice and habit of, of writing their stories because a stories change mm -hmm. you know stories stories give a new perspective stories show that it's possible stories show the way i would like to encourage as many leaders if we assume we are all leaders as many of us that can to write yeah, those are a few things that are happening at civil source okay yeah. what has surprised you the most civil source started in october 27 17. Up to that point in my life, I had always worked for somebody else, on somebody else's vision, mission, which I mean, I don't mind. So when I work with FIDA, yes, I'm passionate about justice for women, but FIDA is somebody else's dream in that sense. So Save Source was the first time I was working with something that I had perceived and started. I think in that moment, in that space, it was the <laughs> How do people, where do I start? And I, I had so many questions, so many moments of not just insecurity, but um, really being scared about how, how does, how, how do I make this happen? And I think in that moment, I realized how much I needed to learn. It was like, yes, I've been a leader all these years, but I suddenly need to learn about leadership again and really hone the skills that one needs to have when they're a CEO of their own company. So I took on a leadership coach I had never done. I knew it was, you know, it's good, people have them, but to realize and recognize the value that mm. they bring and then have one. So it's been very amazing to walk this journey with a coach. The other realization is I think CEOs deal with things that nobody else will ever know about and so about a month ago or so i started writing a blog and it's uh, dear ceo because i i thought rather than struggle alone i'm sure other ceos are also struggling with the same sorts of things and so let me reach out let me share my thoughts my struggles my issues with other ceos and and hoping that this tool will open that conversation dear ceo and yeah the timeline yeah. is from one ceo to another because I, I found in that space the way you think about the business is not the same as everybody in the company the things we agonize over you you are a ceo of your company so you understand what i mean and i think there are things that when you talk to other CEOs, you're like, yeah, I feel you, I know what you mean, I know how you're feeling, I know. So I want it to be that space that, that we hold each other. Other thing that I'm learning is just how much there is to know and to read. Aish. I feel like when you put yourself out there as an organization that wants to influence a field like philanthropy, I keep telling my team, you can't influence a field you don't know. We must be reading um, about philanthropy. What is the mindset of philanthropy? Who gives? Why do they give? What are the trends? Where is it going? Because if we also want to be an organization of the future, we have to predict the future before it arrives. So where is philanthropy going and how do we position ourselves to be an organization of the future, right? So yeah, it's, it's ah, many things in my head. And because we're located in Africa, and what does that look like in my continent? How do we support it? How do we influence it to become stronger, better, bigger? There are some CEOs who at the end of the year mm -hmm. give you their favorite books for that year. Ah, I would read another book that uh, another CEO has, has recommended. I do it a lot on, on Facebook. When I read a book that I like, the reason why I put it out there is to say, this is a great story I found it very interesting. I think you would too. Tell me what you're grateful for. One is sisterhood. 
and sisterhood in all its expressions yes. so my sisters that i've grown up with the sisters that have held me in very many ways i'm grateful for travel i'm here because of the mm -hmm. gift of travel the privilege of travel I, I don't take it for granted that that i can be here and i'm super grateful that this time i came with my son i couldn't even give that gift to him is so i'm grateful for travel i'm grateful for books i wrote recently actually on my facebook page that if you're able to have a book own a book you're among the privileged few and that is sad and so the fact that i can i don't take it for granted it is such a beautiful gift in my life that that i can have books that i can enjoy them that i know how to read so i don't take literacy for granted i don't take my education for granted i don't take love of books for granted those are my dreams oh. i think as i end we've talked a lot about stories recently as as my staff team we were doing a book on leadership a john maxwell book developing the leader within one of the statements he told us was that every day our stories are being told the issue is are you holding the pen are you an active participant in your story or are you letting others uh, do the storytelling for you because either way the story will happen and so story. I invite us be an active participant in your story determine how it's told every day that you wake up take hold of that pen if you've given it away take it back be an active participant in the way you write your story and tell your story thank you so much for being here with on butterflies from bees I am grateful of course always for you coming if you have any questions for Jackie her contact information will be in the description box below so go ahead and check her out she has a very active Twitter she has a very active Facebook so yeah. try and connect with her if you are interested in stories like these if you're interested in some of the work that she yep. is doing yep. <laughs> oh yeah okay okay don't forget to give this video a thumbs up leave your comments in the comment section below for some of the stories that you know of and don't forget to share this video with people who you know will be interested in this stuff share it far and wide and if you have not yet subscribed make sure that you subscribe just click that red button just click it <laughs> and we will see you on the internet somewhere if not on Twitter and Facebook, back here on YouTube. Take care of yourselves. Bye! Bye.